Right on, so second video this week. It's always a sign of a healthy, functioning nation, isn't it? As you well know, we've had a bit of an ammo problem for a while. We want more, and the market can only provide so much. Well, I want you to imagine that somewhere in a cold, faraway place that there's a city where, on one end, trains deliver raw materials, again, by the train load, pure inputs, and on the other, trains carry away arms and ammunition all day. Of course, we don't have anything quite like that here because that degree of vertical integration is actually kind of economically stupid and only somebody with the economic sophistication of a three-year-old would see it done. But it was done, and it can make cheap ammo all day and night. Doesn't that sound pretty helpful right now? Anyway, the Russian ammo ban, or the gun and ammo ban. Just what the heck is going on? In this video, we're going to talk about just went down and what's likely to happen moving forward. So stay tuned. Это ведущий футболистов адвокат, он не ваш адвокат. Возможно, если вы ему заплатите. И в любом случае, это видео не является юридической консультацией. Right on. So there's a lot of confusion going on with this particular situation. A couple weeks back, the Biden administration's Department of State announced that it would be prohibiting the importation of firearms and ammunition manufactured or located in Russia. Of course, lots of us were confused because, wait, we've been getting guns in from Russia? Well, no, we haven't. Literally every president from whatever party has been putting the screws to Russian imports for longer than the Simpsons have been on the air. Very few Russian firearms remained eligible for importation by 2016, and the Trump administration shut off almost all that remained. As far as firearms do go, this present administrative action eliminates whatever twitching remnants remained of Russian arms imports into the U.S. But we all know arms weren't the real object here. It was the billion or so rounds of ammunition that we like to buy from the proofsters every year. Let's also cover what exactly is going on with this. I'll skip to some of the meat and potatoes here because there's a lot of confusion about how the ban's going to work. The press release said that new and pending permit applications for the importation of firearms and ammunition manufactured or located in Russia will be subject to a policy of denial beginning on September 7th, with the sanctions expected to last at least a year. A lot of people are confused, thinking, oh, this won't make much of a difference, right? Because tons of people will still have their permits to import, right? Well, yes, but actually, no. To understand how serious this is, you have to understand how import licenses work. You don't get a license to import as much stuff as you want for as long as you want. Import licenses are for particular transactions. You identify X rounds of ammunition coming in from Y port at Z time. The licenses are limited in scope, quantity, and time. From my experience, I'd say there's likely about three more months of normal amounts of Russian imports before we see this policy choke it to a drip and then dry. The present ban is under the Chemical and Biological Weapons Control and Warfare Elimination Act of 1991. What? You might be asking yourself. What the hell? You may ponder. Well, come sit by the fire, friend, because it's story time. A year ago, Russia may have kind of maybe allegedly poisoned somebody, like, just a little bit. Um, this is Alexei Navalny, a Russian lawyer and a gentleman whose name Vladimir Putin refuses to pronounce. He campaigns against Russian corruption, or whatever. Of course, corrupt countries hate that, so in August of 2020, he was hospitalized after being poisoned a little bit with some Novichok nerve agent. Again, August of 2020. Well, under the present administration's interpretation of the 1991 Act, that's something they need to do something about right now. There are some things under the Act that a U.S. president must do when another country engages in chemical warfare and other things that are discretionary. It probably won't surprise you to find out what category banning the importation of ammunition falls under. Discretionary. Completely discretionary. 
The president has the discretion to choose three sanctions from a long list, and import controls are one of them. So, of course, you know, what's he going to pick the import control? It's just something completely random out of a hat, which has nothing to do with any political motivations or failed gun control objectives at all. We've dealt with sanctions under the 1991 Act before, and they've lasted long after the impetus for the sanction was forgotten. It is yet another tool in the mercantilist toolbox to punish our enemies abroad by cutting off our own people from the products and services that they want. Interestingly, Mr. Poisoned Russian himself, currently spending two and a half years in a forced labor colony in Vladimir Oblast, had this to say about the United States' brave decision to ban Russian ammo imports to avenge his poisoning. There is no need to apply sanctions on Russia, said Navalny. All sanctions were tailored to avoid almost all significant participants in Putin's gang. Do you want evidence? Name one real evildoer who suffered. The airplanes, the yachts, the billions in Western banks. Everything is in its place. So clearly you can see the decision to target tool ammo and the very existence of 545 was very well appreciated by Mr. Navalny. Again, the victim. So why the hell, then, did they do this? Well, it's an interesting trapeze, and it involves the politics of doing nothing and some clever gamesmanship. If you are committed to doing something, like restricting arms, and your efforts are being frustrated, such as by members of your own political party overwhelmingly becoming gun owners, sometimes you have to find a backdoor way to get what you want. This policy, this tortured reading of the 1991 Chemical Warfare Act and the involvement of Russia, was the perfect way to make a titanically political move. It significantly impacts the American arms market, which depends on Russia for 10-30% to 30 of its ammunition supply, depending on the year, stifling the most affordable parts of the market, possibly limiting the influx of new gun owners, all while pretending to be tough on Russia. It's really quite slick in an evil political kind of way. Another common question, then, that I get is, how is this going to impact me, you might be asking. Well, all I can do is give you my gut expectations. Starting with the common calibers, like 9mm and 5.56, lots of stuff was coming in from Russia, but I don't expect this will have a significant impact beyond the six months horizon with a short-term raising of the price floor. Uh, lots of these plants and production have wings in Ukraine and elsewhere, and production can be shifted all while giving Western sources a little more time to catch up. Well, how about 762 by 39? Well, yeah, the majority of this stuff comes in from the East, but loads of it is already made in Ukraine, and the Serbs are jockeying at the chance to enter the market more aggressively, too. I expect we'll see more Ukrainian imports and a prolonged increase in price to make 762 by 39 sit much closer to 556 than we're used to. Well, how about 54R? Well, this is another cartridge that sees widespread production outside of Russia, but still the majority of our new imports do come from Russia. We'll see most significant decreases in availability and price increases more significant than 762 by 39 in my experience. Now for the bad news. How about God's chosen caliber itself, 545 by 39? This, I fear, is going to be a problem. Being a much newer and more boutique cartridge, we see very little 545 production outside of Russia these days. Yes, there is the limited Hornady production, but by God, you know that's not going to help. I expect it will be more difficult to move production around for this cartridge. We're already seeing the price parity with 556, something we've only ever seen in very limited instances before. This is probably going to depress demand for 545 firearms, which may have an equalizing effect. The longer term effect on 545 will depend on whether firms will view it as worthwhile to invest in tooling up outside of Russia, more or less expressly for the American market. So for that one, it's the hardest call. But frankly, the only cartridge I'm really worried about long term effects on is the 545. Times like these, I think it's important to remember the fact that when import controls were placed on colonial America, the founders organized surreptitious imports of as many arms as they could from whatever countries would sell them. So yeah, the people who wrote our constitution would totally think it was A-OK -okay for an administrative agency to choke out the ammunition market as an act of political expediency. At least that's what they taught me in law school, I think. Higher education is great, isn't it? Well, that's it for today, guys. Let me just say I really appreciate you guys watching and subscribing. It makes a huge difference. 
If you want to support me more than that, I started up a Patreon and a Subscribestar. I've added benefits like a patron-only podcast, a Discord, and there's surely going to be more to come. This kind of support will help enable me to make more content more regularly, something I just desperately want to be able to do. There's also a link to the new and improved Fudbusters apparel. We've got stickers, and we've, of course, got the Magic ATF ball. All those links are in the description below, and they all help out. Thank you all so much for watching to the end and for your support. I'll see you next time, or if you become a patron or subscribe star, I'll see you on the Discord. Remember, the anti-side has been working long and hard passing laws and pushing policies like this. Anything more than minimum compliance is self-regulation. Y'all take care. Thank you.